All right, welcome everybody. Big inflation day here. News U.S. inflation hits new four decade high 9.1%. Yeah, we're going back 41 years again. Um, the month over month is <laughs> higher than the year over year was just uh, a couple years ago. Um, you know, very, very hot print. Uh, without a doubt. Again, um, I, I want to be, you know, again, preface, it basically put this thing in proper perspective is what I'm trying to do. Um, this was the numbers for June. Um, things have, uh, as far as commodities are concerned, they've come down considerably uh, over the last couple of weeks. I mean, you can take a look across the board at what commodities have done. They've come down. Um, do I see some relief? Could this be the, the peak in inflation? Could be. Uh, I've seen energy prices come down, oil prices come down. However, uh, you get another price spike, something happens, driving you know barrel oil back up to 120. Uh, we're right back where we started. Uh, but I, I do think that, um, I think moving forward, again, you're going to start seeing a lot of the markdowns we haven't seen yet. And I, I mentioned this on the program. You're going to start seeing it in July, uh, that uh, bullwhip effect when it comes to inventories and companies marking things down. Example, um, I just went online. Um, my kids want me to get a put a television outside on our patio for the fall so they can watch football games with their friends. I go online and I look and, and uh, I mean... 70 inch television and I'm not getting the over expensive outdoor one. I'll just put a cover on it. Um, ridiculous. $300. Are, are you kidding me? I mean, the prices are starting to come down in certain areas. Again, the, the, the most important things we're talking about food and energy still very, very high without a doubt. But again, uh, the, the, one of the aspects in this report was also, um, the uh, clothing aspect. Now that hasn't come down. Uh, autos are, have not come down, but they're going to start. They're going to start. You're seeing a break here, people. A lot of gloom and doom when it comes to this inflation port and what's moving forward. But uh, without a doubt, you're starting to see a slowing in the economy. And you're also seeing companies adjust based upon this. And we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the Euro. And uh, yeah, if you're going to Europe on vacation this year, you're going to be killing it. Um, concern out there in regards to corporate profits. A American company sells something over in France. Uh, somebody buys it in euros. They got to take those euros. They got to move them back to dollars. Changes the dynamic to some degree. Yeah, I get that. I do. But there's two sides to this as well. So American companies also want to purchase and expand and do other things over there in Europe, and it's going to make their costs obviously less as well. So again, two sides to that. And again, a lot of people bang in this drum. It hasn't been this way since 2022. Yeah, that's basically, I mean, at the point in time when all the original uh, members of the European Union adopted the euro. I remember 2021. 2021, I was in Greece and uh, they still had the drachma at that point in time. Again, um, th th does it really matter? No. Again, I think people are paying a little bit too much attention to this. The issue is, is how quickly it happened. Um, beginning of the year, it's been coming down from some time, let's just be honest. But uh, from the beginning of the year to now, I think it was about 115 to the dollar. It's now basically a parody. Here's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about autos and used cars and what's going to happen next. I, I talked about this on the program and the fact that, you know, um, I've got two automobiles that are leases are coming up uh, over the next six months, six, seven months. And, you know, obviously I do my homework. I, what's the buyout on the car? What's the mileage on the car? Um, the reality is I can buy both of the cars out buy both the cars out at the end of the lease and flip them for a profit. Oh, why don't you go ahead and do that? No, I need the cars. 
I need the cars. I'm going to have to replace them. What am I going to replace them with? That, that's the issue. Um, if I was to turn one of the cars in um, and I was to lease the same exact model car, same exact model SUV, um, I'm going to be paying almost $200 a month more than I am now. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? But again, I think you're going to see some sort of change of stories now. I'm calling a canary in a coal mine. Uh, repos from auto loans that originated in 2020 and 2021 are starting to skyrocket. Again, you get a lot of people out there that felt like they were flush with cash. And believe me, there's a lot of people who bought cars with their PPP loans and all sorts of other handouts. And guess what? They're not feeling so flush right now. They're not paying their bills. Cars are getting turned in. And this, it's slowly going to happen. It's going to add more inventory uh, to the entire used car market, which we need to have happen. Need to have happen. Um, spoken with some people involved in uh, the auctions uh, for used cars, and, and the prices are starting to come down. That most certainly is a step in the right direction. Again, let's be honest. Okay, one of the issues we have with with automobiles right now it's it's without a doubt it's supply, supply problems, supply issues, and again, it's self inflicted. It's the way we decided to do our supply chains. And we have to deal with this now. Um, I want to talk about this yesterday in market action and the way things traded yesterday in the markets that were up. And then all of a sudden, you started seeing some weakness in the afternoon. And I, I took a look at the, the charts. I saw what was going on. I said, something's up. Something is up. Something's not right. And then in the last hour of trading, everything fell off the cliff. As it turns out, I was right. Something was up. And I knew it. I knew it. Somebody basically floated a fake CPI report showing that inflation was going to run hotter than 10%. And uh, again, the algorithmic traders take over and drive the markets down. Uh, again, when you hear stories like this, it, you know, people will, will, you know, they'll hear about it and they'll send me emails, stock markets fixed. It's not fair. Um, it's not fixed, but you're most certainly right. It's not fair, but nothing in life is. Nothing in life is. This is why, again, trying to time the markets, trying to operate over the short term is an exercise in futility, simply because guess what? Bad actors will get away with shit like this. They will. You know, you deal with it, is, is what I say. I mean, maybe they'll get caught at some point in time. Who knows? But you only allow these bad actors and things like this to affect you, again, if you are a short-term player. Focus on the long-term, these things you push out of the equation. Quickly uh, on this story here, we, we talked about the, uh, the latest Supreme Court case uh, against the, the EPA, and there was an uh, editorial today in the Wall Street Journal uh, basically making the point that, uh, guess what? Guess what? This this case against uh, ruling against the government. Guess what? They're gonna. It's the same thing is going to be for the Securities and Exchange Commission with some of the push that they're having uh, in regards to this ESG investing nonsense that they're trying to force upon everyone. So, I mean, again, I hope. I hope. I again, you know, this is where you would think um, libertarian and true conservative think tanks, groups, whatever it may be, should be filing lawsuits. Uh, that's what we need to have happen. Uh, the Supreme Court, as it's structured today, is a great opportunity to dismantle the administrative state, and we need to be uh, getting at it. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, being honest. I, I make fun of this economist all the time all the time here on the program. I can't remember the last time I agreed with something that he said in one of his columns. He is a far left economist. He's a professor at Princeton. Paul Krugman. Guy, I'm tired. You're going to be surprised by this. But again, I'm honest. Here. 
He had a, a column today. His column today in the New York Times is, calls it the um, humbug economy. And he called it the humbug economy. There was some story about uh, Einstein. Uh, no, who was it about? It was Charles Darwin, excuse me. Some story about Charles Darwin and how some of his, uh, I guess, students were piecing together pieces of bugs and, and, you know, trying to trick him and saying, you know, what bug is this? And he obviously knew Darwin's like, did it, uh, did it hum when you he caught it? And they said, yes. Well, then call it a humbug, whatever. So Krugman's column is called the humbug economy. And he's talking about all of these pieces of information that we're getting that oftentimes are contradictory. Again, we try to decipher them here on the program. Uh, for instance, you had uh, today, you had the CEO of Delta Airlines. CEO of Delta Airlines is on and they're just killing it with revenues. They are at, their revenues are through the roof, okay? Their earnings were down. Earnings were down because of certain costs that were incurred, but even moving out past Labor Day into the fall. This was a concern. Bookings, very, very high. Um, go to restaurants, go to hotels, filled. Uh, talk to you know, certain retailers out there. Eh, consumers still pretty darn strong. The uh, CEO of Costco this past week talking about, yeah, you know, certain people are feeling it a little bit, but they're still buying and we're still doing really well. You're getting all these bits of information out there. And the point by Krugman's column is, is that based upon whatever side of the aisle you're on, whatever you believe, you can take these information and you can craft them to whatever narrative you choose. And that most certainly is the case. We're trying to get across here. You're watching all of these people parade themselves uh, on TV. See, I never, I never claimed that I'm able to uh, predict what's going to happen. I, I I just know, I know what I'm good at. Again, I, I, I'm good at picking high quality companies that are going to work well over a long period of time. We're good at balancing portfolios. I, I know what we're good at. I know what we're capable of doing. We don't try to do things that we can't do. And quite frankly, in my belief system, no one can. No one can. Unless, of course, you know, you, again, you, the old Gordon Gecko. You're either on the inside or you're on the outside. There's players there that, again, yeah, they can take advantage of information and things, regulatory capture, who you know, and don't tell me they don't make moves. I've been around the block long enough. I'm not a member of that club. It's not what we do. So, again, I, I could, this is the first time, first time, and I, I can't remember the last time, quite frankly. I've been doing the radio show for uh, over 20-something years, and we have We've gone after just the idiocy of Paul Krugman time and time again, but actually today he had a column that made sense. What is today? Yeah, it's July 13th, 2022. Founders of um, the crypto hedge fund 3AC have gone missing. Gone missing. Uh, three Arrows Capital, they appear to be on the run from creditors. <laughs> a crypto hedge fund, I mean, honestly, okay. Okay, I, I mean, I, 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 can't you just call it a day saying, you know what, I got duped. I know it sucks, but you, you're investing in a hedge fund that's probably using leverage in made-up currencies Man, I don't think you can really get more speculative than that. Uh, I mean, what do you, what are you going to do? I mean, you really think you're going to recoup your assets in this? You really think that that's going to happen? Sorry, folks, not going to. All right, um, this has been a uh, it's been a thorn in my side for a period of time. I want to share with you. This is a column column today, actually editorial board, Wall Street Journal, uh, big echo chamber piece for me. I uh, wasn't too long ago here. Maybe I'll, I'll look up the, the, the people again. I actually went through the members of the Federal Reserve Board and the various different heads and um, their experience in the private sector. Basically none. Statistically zero. Statistically speaking, okay, statistically, it's zero... Zero experience in the private sector for members of the uh, Federal Reserve Board. Well, let's let's get into Washington, D.C. Let's get into the Biden 
administration. Troubling trend in the Democratic Party in recent years is its increasing detachment from the private economy. That's shown itself in the Biden administration's economic management. And one reason may be that few of its officials have experience in private business. Um, Stephen Moore, John Decker have got a report on this. Um, that basically they have a group called the Committee to Unleash Prosperity. They studied the resumes of 68 top, top men. We've got top men working on it right now. Remember, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Top executive branch officials whose work shapes the economy. From Biden to Yellen, you name it. Special assistance on economic policy. The, wait for it. The average business experience of Biden appointees. 2.4 years. Another column, they say, any fresh-faced 25-year-old on Wall Street has clocked more private business hours than most of Washington's top officials. I clocked more. I clocked more business hours, private business hours, when I was 16. Forget about 25. When I was 16 years old. 62% have virtually no business experience. Now, again, want to do a contrast. The average Donald Trump cabinet official had 13 years of experience in the private economy. Now, uh, some familiarity with business is especially important given that President Biden and Kamala have spent their lives in law or politics. But the authors found that the Biden economic officialdom is dominated by careers in law, 20, politics and government, 21, academia or policymaking, 12. The main business experience is in venture capital or investing, which is five. And then you take a look at specific people. You got that uh, Javier uh, Becerra, uh, health and human services right there. He's got zero. Zero experience and healthcare. Mayor Pete, he was a mayor and a management consultant. Does he have any idea how supply chains work? No, 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 no. Innocence of profits, payrolls, and competition seems to count as a virtue among today's progressive, but it isn't a virtue when modern government has so much power to regulate and punish private businesses. You don't say. But again, again, it just popped in the top of my head. You're doing a great job, Brownie. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, remember, that? remember that? He was in charge of FEMA. What was, I don't remember his first name and his last name was Brown and Bush told him he was doing a great job. And uh, they looked up his experience in Katrina and it was, um, I don't know, he ran some horse show. Ran some horse show. Anyway, um, well, because of this, it, it's a wonder. Confidence in U.S. media, government and justice system is collapsing. Americans' confidence in major U.S. institutions, including government and the media, is in a state of collapse, falling to an average of just 27% across all categories. You don't say, wow, shocker, because guess what? You're you're doing so well. Anyway, um, Google announced today. Well, it announced it was kind of a memo, got out emails sent to employees that Google is going to be slowing the pace of its hiring for the rest of the year. Um, it hired about 10,000 new employees in the second quarter and uh, more who committed to start this quarter. Uh, they have 163,906 employees at the end of March, 17% more than the year earlier. Moving forward, we need to be more entrepreneurial, working with greater urgency, sharper focus, and more hunger than we've shown on sunnier days. Again, smart. This is what you do during a recession, during a slowdown. This is where these companies, again, they come out of these things on the other side better than they were coming in. And yes, guess what? Sometimes that involves layoffs. That's a big thing for people on the left. Oh, they're just lowering the stock price. Low, low, they're raising the stock, excuse me, lowering the head count to raise the stock price. And we, we can go to the Bobs from office space. Um, what exactly 
do you say you do here? Again, many people there. Not that useful? Well, goodbye. Goodbye. See, I, the people that we, I, I operate in that fashion all the time. I do. I have to have a conscious effort of our costs and what we're doing and our staffing. Because again, it matters to my clients. So obviously we can keep our fees down. I mean, that's, that's what we want to do. But, you know, again, a lot of times when things are going crazy, these mega corporations, again, it can get out of hand. It can get out of hand with the hiring. And a lot of people can get lost in the sauce. Well, guess what? Time to uh, get rid of some of those people that are lost. I have no problem with it at all. Yeah, I mean, I told that story at Carl Icahn where he stepped in. And it was, what was it, what was it a railroad company, if I'm not mistaken. And he came out and he, he mentioned, came right out and said, I said, I fire the entire, did a study, fire the entire floor of uh, 12 floors of it, people and it wouldn't matter. Anyway, um, another story. And this is kind of pathetic, quite frankly. London's Heathrow Airport limits passengers uh, amid staff shortages and surging demand. Why the, why the hell do they have staff shortages over in Europe for crying out loud? Uh, how is that possible? They're... Employment rates, I mean, are hell of a lot. Unemployment rates are hell of a lot higher than ours. Not to mention the fact, these are like coveted jobs. These, I mean, you get a job working for the government, working for an airport, for crying out loud, um, you can't get fired. It's next to impossible. I forget how many weeks vacation you get a year and all this stuff. I mean, it's fascinating to me how they haven't been able to handle that. Uh, EV startup, Rivian looking to cut costs, make workforce reductions. You don't say. Um, again, they're, they're having to get, they're trying to get rid of some of their white collar workers. They just, they, I'm looking at, at the numbers here. They got about 14,000 people looking to fire about 5%. Yeah, they got about $19 billion in cash. They sold 4,400 vehicles in the second quarter. Um, it's an increase, an increase, but let's be honest here. They sold 4,400 vehicles. They brought in 95 million in revenue, but they lost 1.6 billion. Now they got $17 billion in cash. Again, you, you can calculate, you can calculate right based upon their numbers right now, what the burn rate is. And at what point in time, if Rivian doesn't raise extra money and things don't improve a great deal, when they're going to go out of business. I'm not saying that they are. But it was the CEO, Rivian himself, came out and said, I don't, I don't see where we're going to be getting the materials for cars moving forward. And, I, you know, again, you're competing as these small players here. And I'm sure they've got some clout and some politicians in their pocket here and there. Uh, but you're, you're still competing against Government Motors, who's going all in with EVs too. And, and when push comes to shove, again, who do you, who do you think is going to get the materials? Is it going to be General Motors or is it going to be Rivian? Anyway, something to consider. This is some of the risk that one takes in some of these speculative plays. You know, there's political risk, there's regulatory risk. And again, you're, you're, you're playing against some <laughs> legacy, legacy players. Let's just leave it at that. All right, let's, let's go on to well, energy and uh, the geopolitical stuff in the Ukraine here, um, as it turns out, I know Biden's heading off to Saudi Arabia. Um, U.S. and European sanctions have led to a significant shift in the direction of Russian energy flows. Bloomberg reporting that diesel and other fuel products, which are shunned by many countries in the West, are heading to the Middle East. That's right. Heading to the Middle East. These are refined products. Again, I, I told you this was going to happen. Somebody's going to buy it. Somebody's going to buy it. And if you put, come on, you put energy on sale, 
it is going to get gobbled up without fail. No if, ands, or buts about it. Wall Street Journal, again, constantly, this, this newspaper bangs war drums. It's, it's perpetual. Um, the West leaves Ukraine outgunned against Russia. And you could skip the entire article. You can. You can go through, you know, talking about how they don't have the missiles and they don't have it. And Russia's changed the way that they're doing things and they're hiding behind uh, some of their heavy artillery and the Ukraine doesn't have it. Mind you, mind you, some of the stuff that's been delivered to the Ukraine, it's already been reported that it's been sold on the black market. Anyway, neither here nor there. The West leaves Ukraine outgunned against Russia. What, what is, think about that. It's that statement for a second. The only way that the Ukraine would not be outgunned against Russia is if we delivered nuclear weapons. Are we planning on doing that? Are we planning on doing that? The only way. Well, you, you think that the Ukraine is going to actually... They're, of course, they're going to be outgunned. How could they not be outgunned? It's obvious. Now, again, whether or not you want to continue to fight to the last Ukrainian and you want to continue to push weapons into that country, I, I don't know. But the reality of the situation is they're never going to catch up. They're never going to catch up at, at some point in time, some people have got to kind of recognize the reality of the terrain, but uh, we've already got Democrats out there uh, demanding more money, this time from the IMF. This time from the IMF, they, they want to, uh, with these um, uh, special drawing rights that you have at the IMF, they want to uh, $650 billion in IMF aid for Ukraine. Now, how much of that money do you think is going to end up in Swiss bank accounts, uh, Cayman Island accounts, and, and just stolen? $650 billion in special drawing rights for Ukraine. Now, you compare the United States to the Ukraine, and you know, as far as the corruption meter is concerned, we've got a lot of corruption here. They got a hell of a lot more of it there. We, we can't even, we, here in this country, we can't even get PPP out the right way. We can't even get unemployment benefits out the right way. We get more waste, fraud, scams, whatever it may be. What do you think is going to happen there when you drop $650 billion special drawing rights? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Now, you're sure they'll push come to the show. There'll be some agreement and you'll end up with oligarchs. You'll end up with oligarchs, some, some rich people that control most of the economy. Anyway, um, guys, I'm going to play this this weekend on the radio show. I thought it was a joke. Again, I had to do a double take. I thought it was a joke. I, again, I thought the Babylon Bee did it. I watched a PSA put out by New York City. New York City put out a PSA, their emergency management agency, basically telling people what to do in case of a nuclear attack. Now, I thought that that went the way of the 1970s. And again, I, I do recall, do recall being in a classroom and they're doing bomb alerts during the Cold War and hiding underneath your desk and knowing. Knowing at that point in time what an exercise in futility the entire thing was. The entire exercise was. It's one of the starting points where I started questioning authority on basically everything. So they actually put out a PSA, what to do. And make sure you get inside and stay away from the window. And if you're outside after the blasts went off, gather your clothes and put them in a bag and dispose of them. And watch media, listen to media. Media. You think you're going to be able to get any sort of media? Huh? You, you think your 5G is going to be up and running? <laughs> I, again, couldn't make it up. Couldn't make it up. Um, Fauci uh, coming out and admitting that the uh, COVID-19 vaccine does not protect overly well against infection. Uh, 
Fauci is, I think he's the highest paid government worker in the country. Highest paid government worker in the country. We told you this a long, long, long time ago. The uh, highest paid government official in the country is telling you now. Thank you, Master the Obvious. Appreciate it. You know, again, words have meaning. Don't call it a vaccine then. Don't call it a vaccine. Call it Tamiflu, okay, or preventative for worst case, whatever you want to do. But this is part of the problem. It is the BS you constantly throw at people. And guess what? People are starting to wake up to all of your BS. Starbucks, good for them, closing 16 stores in major cities due to increasing threats from bathroom drug dens. Again, they're shutting them down and they're moving the workers there to other locations. And I would strongly suggest other businesses do the same. Sorry. At some point in time, you have to move. Okay? I, I, I go back to that old Sam Kinison skit back from the 1980s where he was making fun of uh, all the aid being sent to Africa. Making fun of all the aid being sent to Africa. And he's like, I'm not going to send them money. I'm going to send them U-Hauls. Tell them to move to where the food is. A at some point in time, you got to move to where there isn't any crime. You got the same thing in, in California. Uh, LA area 7-Elevens encouraged to close after string of violence and robberies. Again, I, you know, maybe several of you want to keep those stores open. You, you might want to just announce that our, uh, our checkout people are armed and you will be shot. Ben, it's California. They're not going to do that. Anyway, watchdogonwallstreet.com. Watchdogonwallstreet.com. Have a great day, everybody.